Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we would like to welcome you to today's webinar. It is a pleasure to have all of you joining us this uh, afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Angela Ndunge. I am the Deputy Executive Dean in Strathmore University Business School, and I'm also the moderator for today's uh, discussion. I am joined by a group of distinguished um, leaders, all um, leading in various capacities uh, during today's uh, webinar. This particular topic was chosen because, of course, crisis management has been a topical issue in terms of um, business and business continuity. Of course, this has now been exacerbated by the current um, COVID-19 pandemic, but the topic we are discussing, we'll be discussing it from a much broader perspective. However, also drawing some key learnings that we have gotten through the process of managing and navigating the challenges that have been brought about by the COVID-19 um, pandemic. We have drawn the panelists from uh, the East Africa, from the East African region. So we are also excited that we are going to be drawing perspectives from Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Kenya, and just learning from the, past, uh, the panelists, the different experiences that they have been having given the different con uh, contexts all of us are operating in. So I will go ahead to introduce them um, in detail. So I will start with uh, uh, Dr. Martin Odwar Otieno. So many of you have known him maybe uh, previously as he was the um, group CEO of Kenya Commercial Bank. But he's currently an independent business advisor and accredited coach and governance auditor. He runs the consulting firm, the Leadership Group Limited, and he sits in a number of boards. Uh, I believe they include uh, British BAT, British American Tobacco, EABL, among others. He's also the course leader of leading the board. Uh, one of the corporate governance programs we have in Strathmore University Business School under the executive education. Um, we also have to, with us uh, Dr. Peter Chimboa. Peter is a leadership uh, catalyst, talent optimization coach, and he's a board member and advisor to several boards in Uganda. They include ESCOM, Equity, uh, among others, and he's also one of the advisory board members of Strathmore University Business School, Uganda Leadership Academy. So again, welcome Peter, welcome Martin. We also have Mr. Uh, Gift Shoko. He is a career banker with over 20 years of experience in banking, both merchant banking and commercial banking. He's currently the chief executive officer of Commercial Bank of Africa, Tanzania where he's overall in charge of steering the business of the bank. He's also a, a consistent and business partner of Tanzania Leadership Academy, which is uh, an arm of Strathmore University Business School Executive Education. We also have uh, Antonia Mutoro. Antonia is currently the national coordinator of Forum for African Women at Educationalists. And she's also uh, the former Executive Secretary of the National Capacity Building Secretariat in Rwanda. And also uh, is an educationalist and holds a master's of education degrees from Leeds University, United Kingdom. Aside from that, she's also uh, a faculty in the SBS Rwanda Leadership Academy. So I would like to welcome those. To support us in the background, we have uh, Nancy Dirangu, who has been our business development manager in charge of our corporate governance programs, and Shadrach Mwangangi, please put on your videos and wave where you are. Uh, we have, yes, Nancy there waving. So she'll be here to support. And also, if you have any questions, she'll be 
be there to manage the questions also uh, business development programs that we have. So a little bit of uh, housekeeping and in how we are going to go up through this uh, webinar. So we'll have um, a, the beginning part of this webinar where we'll hear from the speakers and the panelists on the topic. And then after we are with that part, we will be moving to a question and answer session where any questions from the experience that you have, you would like uh, answered, we will be taking them uh, at the end. But also we want to make sure that the, the conversation is interactive. So the chat function in your Zoom um, taskbar there at the bottom, we will be using it. But uh, in terms of giving people an opportunity to talk, we would want to do that in an orderly way. So if you have a question, again, on the sidebar of the chat, there is a raise your hand function there. So that raise your hand function, if uh, you have something you want to contribute and you want to contribute verbally, please raise your hand and I'll be looking out for raised hands and uh, invite you to comment verbally. Otherwise, you're invited to comment and also ask questions over the chat and we'll continue to pick them up as we go along and as we continue with the conversation. So maybe as we start us off with the topic, which was uh, looking at how does the board support the management at a time of crisis, I will just invite uh, Mr. Dr. Martin Odor to start by just giving us a quick preamble on an introduction to the subject and helping us to just understand and demystify the role of the management, the role of the board in a crisis management context and how these two functions work or work together. So Karibu, Dr. Martin Odor, you can now kick us off. Thank you very much, uh, Angela, and I'm delighted to be here. Let me just share my screen so that uh, we, can get, uh, we can get going. Um, can you see that, Angela? Yes, we can. Right. So, um, glad to be here. And the subject of our discussion today is, uh, how does the board support the management at a time of crisis? Um, and specifically, Angela has asked me to just make a few remarks on demystifying and clarifying the roles of management and the board in, in crisis management. Um, crisis has been uh, defined as something that uh, creates intense difficulty or intense danger. Uh, and uh, I want to go and, and just go straight and, 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 and bring in the, the question of COVID-19 uh, as we make this introduction. So first of all, as all of us uh, on, this, on this call will, will, will uh, remember, uh, one of the words that has been used uh, probably more than any other word during this time is the word unprecedented, that we are going through un unprecedented times, unprecedented crisis uh, through this COVID that uh, all of us are having to learn very fast because this has not happened before and therefore uh, we don't know in a sense how to behave and how to respond. Uh, we know what has happened to the various economies uh, in the world and in East Africa in our own countries. Uh, consumer purchasing power is down, economic growth has been decimated. Uh, if we look back three months ago when uh, COVID first uh, reared its ugly head in our territory, uh, there's initial shock, initial uh, uh, inertia, a lot of uncertainty as how people are going to respond. People asking how long this would last, when it would end, etc. And uh, very, very quickly then people uh, began to, to think that, uh, you know, this is real and we must then respond very, very fast and see how we are going to, um, to go forward with our, with our businesses. With regard to organizations, therefore, uh, there were initial responses around setting up crisis management or business management uh, teams uh, in the organizations uh, as people began to think about what was happening today and how to respond immediately, but also beginning to think about the future and how organizations would rebound in the future. 
and also recognizing very much that a lot of our plans and strategic plans have been thrown out uh, literally and we're going to be out by anything from one year onwards. And so when we think about this, and I've picked up a quote uh, here, which I have on the screen, which uh, I'll read to you. Uh, for business leaders, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated unprecedented change. More than ever, the health of businesses is urgently and visibly linked with the health of workforces, the health of society, and the health of our planet. Previously unimaginable shifts in our daily lives are compelling companies to adapt quickly and identify creative and conventional ways to operate and to survive. So I find this, this very, very important for this crisis and even for past uh, uh, crises. And uh, you know, going through some of the literature, um, I came across this saying by a former Secretary of State of the US, Henry Kissinger. Um, the historic challenge for leaders is to manage the crisis while building the future. So as leaders, both as boards and management, we are charged with uh, both looking at managing the crisis today, but also seeing how we are building the future of our organizations. So if I look at the roles of the board and the roles of, uh, of, of management, uh, clearly uh, boards are charged with the responsibility of providing oversight uh, for the institutions uh, in, whose, uh, in whose, boards they, uh, whose boards they operate in. Um, and providing oversight in a time of crisis would clearly cover things like acting as a sounding board uh, to, to management, being available for management to consult and, and to work with. Um, management is going to be uh, busy working on, on strategies, thinking about what's happening today, what should happen tomorrow, what are some of the key strategic decisions and, and actions that need to be taken? And the board needs to be there to uh, evaluate some of those uh, decisions and actions and, and endorse them as appropriate or challenge them uh, as appropriate. There's also a third role, which is around uh, managing stakeholders, both internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. And again, the board being available to support management uh, in, in that through the crisis period. If I look at the role of the executive uh, during uh, a crisis, again, certainly, uh, even prior to the crisis arising, uh, well-run organizations do have risk management plans and policies, and part of that includes crisis management or business continuity plans. And therefore, uh, as a crisis strikes, uh, the, the executive needs to, to pick up those, uh, those crisis plans uh, with the rele relevant teams, look at the information that is available, uh, what is not available, what is happening, understand exactly what is, what is going on and the impact in the organization and in the wider society, determine what critical decisions need to be taken uh, and who is going to take those decisions, organize uh, management and staff uh, appropriately, understand who is impacted as key stakeholders and develop a strategy. And part of this, uh, I believe in a crisis, is really a strategy around communication both internally uh, and externally. And uh, we'll come to discuss this, uh, this shortly. Uh, this communication obviously includes uh, communication and engagement with the boards uh, of directors as well, uh, as management seeks their support, as, uh, as I've just mentioned. And finally, just reflecting on some of the broader questions that boards need to, uh, to ask as they navigate uh, through uh, uh, our particular crisis, but, but generally uh, it's crisis, first of all, is the executive uh, adequate? Uh, do we have the right kind of leadership through this crisis? Uh, have we given them the right mandate or are, they, are we going to expect them to be coming back to the boards uh, for every simple decision? Are they empowered enough to run the business and only come to us for strategic decisions as appropriate? Uh, are we supporting management effectively? Uh, are we providing stakeholders with the information uh, they need? What about in terms of the board itself and the board's operations? Are we structured in a way that will enable us to respond and support management uh, in its quest to continue uh, holding the company uh, together? But also, and perhaps quite important, is beyond the crisis, are we as a board working with management to determine what the situation will look like, what actions need uh, to be taken? Uh, and finally, what about the people agenda? Are we taking us, uh, care of ourselves? 
Are we taking care of management? Is management taking care of the rest of the staff and the teams? Uh, and again, we've seen a number of initiatives during this period of COVID that uh, organizations have taken. So I'd like to kind of stop there. Uh, this was by way of introduction. And we can then, Angela, get uh, into the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Martin Odrur. So probably my next question will just pick up on what you have just uh, presented. Now going into the nitty gritty of it, which is, uh, of course, yes, the crisis unprecedented, but there are also things which uh, people could have uh, predicted or have had in mind before the crisis, because I believe everybody had a plan. So maybe from, the, um, from that perspective, what, what would you say are the key aspects that boards need to take into consideration when uh, supporting management? Because there's what needs to be done maybe before, and then there's what that needs to be done during the crisis. And also there's the aspect of what needs to be done post the, the, um, the crisis. So I wanted to just pick up that in a bit more detail and maybe ask uh, yourself as you're starting, maybe to give us now from a strategy, from the finance perspective, what are those things that need to be there or needed to have been there in managing the crisis or as we go along? So, so thanks, Angela. I, I, I believe that uh, you know, most uh, well-run organizations, as I've mentioned, um, would have a, a risk process that try to, uh, tries to identify some of the critical risks in the organization, uh, the risk to the business, the risk to strategy. Um, so if you talk about uh, what should be happening before, uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, organizations need to, have, need to prepare themselves because you don't know when a crisis would arise and what kind of crisis. And therefore, to have uh, a well-formulated and documented risk management plan that looks at all aspects of the business, including the strategy and the finance that you have referred to. Um, when you get into, uh, when the, the crisis strikes like now, uh, important to uh, very, very quickly uh, assemble those teams that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that will be responding uh, to that crisis. It's important then to uh, begin to evaluate what the impact of that crisis is uh, on your finances, on your strategy, uh, to be able to work out different scenarios as to you know, what would happen in that scenario, in that scenario, et cetera, et cetera, and what's our response likely to be. And moving into the period, be, uh, the, the period uh, after the crisis, again, uh, really selecting, choosing, and agreeing uh, on which is the best strategy to move forward, uh, what have been the impacts uh, on, on, our financial, on our financials, for example, and how do we move forward so that we continue operating as a successful business taking into account what it is that has happened, that that crisis has brought, has brought along. So, so, so Angela, that is kind of before, during, and after from a strategy and finance perspective. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peter Kichimboa. Maybe we can hear from you and maybe share. Uh, when um, Dr. Martin was trying to give us a preamble, he mentioned about the aspect of people, uh, communications, and the different stakeholders. How would you recommend or what are the key aspects that need to be taken into account when you're looking into matters, people, matters, stakeholders, um, from a board perspective? Uh, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Angela and the, uh, Martin. From the perspective of people and also stakeholders, first of all, there's something called mindset and also behavior. So the, with regard to a crisis, and sometimes it's very difficult to predict the crisis. And in this particular case, the virus pandemic, no amount of statistical modeling could have prepared anyone for the magnitude and even the impact of this crisis. So from a people perspective, it is more about keeping an open mind and a deep sense of curiosity and also willingness to experiment. So that's from the point of mindset. And the mindset also underlines something very interesting Martin talked about. Uh, the fact that if you consider this crisis to be a crisis, then you will drop. If you consider this crisis to be an opportunity, then you can rise. You can go through it. 
And this is a niche of mindset. The other area is the language that we use within the organization. Language shapes thought, but more than thought, language shapes and creates reality. So the kind of language we use, uh, for instance, as a board, is not to tell management what to do, but to ask, to inquire from management. And the language is more about asking. And the questions we are asking are supposed to uncover new truths. They are supposed to reveal anomalies and not telling management what they are supposed to do. Uh, governance by its very nature, especially at the board level, at the board, your work is to provide, number one, insight, what happened in the past, but also insight of what's happening now, but also foresight, and finally, oversight. Now, that's the work that a body must discharge at this point. Now, with regard to people, the issue to focus on is, there are about five issues that one needs to focus on. Number one is to replenish the internal risk management system around people, around work, around the workforce, around the workplace, the, the ways of working. So how is, is there anything that we can do different? Why are we missing? Where should be the next opportunity? And so the, the board simply asks questions because questions do more. Uh, some, one writer told, told us that sometimes when you ask questions, you, you are willing to appear like a fool for five minutes. But somebody who never asks a question it remains a fool forever. So uh, the issue is how can we replenish our internal people risk management system? Number two is to look at talent optimization. How well are we using our people? What is the biggest risk area within our structure and also within our processes with regard to people? Uh, are there individuals now in this risk management? Uh, uh, there are people in this crisis that we need to carry on micro skilling, upskilling, reskilling. What do we need to do with our people? How well are we keeping them? Securing their lives, but also uh, ensuring that we safeguard livelihood. So what, what's the conversation between and among a quarantine, because it, it will be a quarantine brand. How do we motivate our people to perform better? And how do we incentivize them? when they are actually working remotely, or if they are going to go be with us. So uh, around people is the other issue of, again, the board assisting management to redefine who this organization is, the very purpose of this organization. What do we stand for? How much care do we give our people? It's only in the moments of adversity that character is defined. So how well are we securing the lives of our staff and also our customers and also our stakeholders, but how are we also safeguarding the fact that we have to go ahead? Right now, I think they, there is the threat of layoffs, there is the threat of uh, redundancies and so on. Uh, let, let's try to create a balance. We need to take care of our people, but at the same time, we have to secure the lifeblood of our, of, of our organization. The third issue is communication, vibrant, frequent, and robust communication. Between who? Between the board and the management. Now, the traditional meetings that we board has with management are supposed to be suspended for a while. Why? Because we are in a crisis. We need information as frequently as possible. Even when there are no updates, the board must be updated. On the latest information, on the latest trend, and the implications, on priority actions that the management is going to take and the risk embedded in those actions and the implications. So the board will write questions. It's okay to trust management, but it's important to verify. So in terms of communication, I think the board has to support management in enhancing a multimedia approach to communication and know exactly what's going on and how they can support. You can't support when you don't know what's going on. In the governance, they say uh, prescription before diagnosis is a malpractice, just like it is in medicine. So the fourth aspect about people is the digital transformation of the organization today. Uh, the digital agenda, how is this going to affect people? How, what kind of skills, like I mentioned earlier, what kind of skills do we need to drive Digital transformation, not only at management level, but also at board level. If you look at the, the, the 
silent matrix of the board. Where is the board also lacking? Because the board must ask questions, but they must ask intelligent questions. They must be questions that bring the organization to a new level of understanding and confidence. So digital transformation also talks about cyber security and cyber crime, which is done again by people. So this is a people issue, digital transformation. The fifth area for the board with regard to people is what is happening and what's going on within the legal and the regulatory space. What is government saying? What are the new raft of measures that government saw? And how are these going to affect the life and also the livelihood of our people? That's all I can say at the moment, Angela, about people and preparation in the crisis. Okay, and I like the part you have said about uh, you must throw away the all the way you are doing things in terms of communication, and there needs to be accelerated uh, communication. So I'm just wanted you to uh, maybe indulge us a little bit more because when uh, uh, Dr. Martin was doing his introduction about the roles. Where do you do, draw the boundaries? You say it has to be intelligent questions, but they must be able to uh, provide information so that they are supported. So I know they could be an easy tug of war in terms of one is meddling in the other's business. How do you manage that dynamic from a people stakeholder of ensuring that the board is not meddling too much or the, uh, the, the senior management are not probably uh, in a position where uh, they feel overmanaged or have a, the other opposite situation where they are being undermanaged. How do you find that balance or how do you uh, manage that, especially now that there's a fight, everything is unprecedented? Maybe you can give us a bit more on that aspect. Is first of all, uh, one of the first things that I have to do is to build trust, mutual trust yes. between uh, board and management so that. Uh, the, first of all, management understands very clearly that the board is going to just put the nose and the eyes in, but not the fingers. Mm -hmm. And really that should be very clear. And the boundaries are properly drawn. That our work is to support through what we call a coaching approach to enhancing uh, crisis management uh, strategy. Uh, and the, the, the meetings, in my opinion, especially in a crisis, should be as frequent, and this depends on the organization. But I would imagine that a session of about 20 minutes every week or every 10 days would be quite right. Why? Because the, um, the disruption is, is so rapid. And board members like myself and management, we need to know one thing. And I think there was a guy called uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was the US Secretary for Defense. He said, in a crisis, there are things we know we know. There are things we know we don't know. There are things we don't know, we don't know. So one thing between a board and management, there is that the need for humility. They need to accept the fact that we all don't know it all. And the more we share, the better. And when we share for us as a board, we are going to do three things. We are going to ask questions, we are going to analyze what you're saying, and we are going to follow through. Following through means what? What has happened since then? Where do you need a lot more help? Why do you need that help? What is the challenge? What is the solution? And what will be the impact? Board members, modern board members operate through questions. Very, very logical sequence questions, but as frequent as possible in order to reduce the amount of time of debate and argument in a full body system. Why? Because we are all in this together. Our fortunes are tied. The success of uh, an, an organization is not success that is associated with the, with the management alone. Uh, the board is also uh, involved in this. So uh, I think the idea is to clearly define and accept the boundaries uh, that board members are going to observe strictly and professionally. We are not going to tell you what to do, but we are going to keep asking questions that are supposed to reveal new truths and new approaches. Okay. Thank you for that. Um... Dr. Chimboam, I'd like to hear from Gift uh, Shoko now on the aspects of uh, just preparations from the perspective of risk compliance operations. What did you, what can you bring to as the key issues that uh, boards need to be aware of or into looking into? 
thanks, uh, Dr. Nens, uh, for that. Uh, as uh, previous speakers have said, these are very difficult times, and uh, such has never happened during the during our lifetime. So you find that we are all learners in this uh, during this crisis. However, before the crisis, there are basic things that would have been expected in organizations to be in place. Uh, these include a, a functional risk committee of the board. That's uh, very critical. Of course, we have been dealing before with uh, minor crises like the financial crisis of 2008, which taught us something. I'm sure many organizations, regardless of size, they picked some lessons from there and were in some level of preparedness where boards provided oversight in terms of the risk management framework. Because it's very critical for every organization, regardless of size, to have a documented risk management framework. So the enforcement of that, of course, is done by management, but there is need for the board to appreciate the need uh, for a documented risk uh, management framework that is sound and that will protect the organization against the effects of uh, crisis. So that also includes having a, a business continuity plan. We have had uh, several incidences in the past, terrorists and uh, crises that have happened, and that if, uh, those have prepared organizations to be prepared in terms of having in place, tested uh, and updated regularly, BCP plans. That's very critical and it's an expectation that prior to this COVID-19 pandemic, organizations that had such in place, that had uh, part of their board oversight focusing on risk, such organizations would be agile in terms of their response. Such organizations would be quicker to respond to such events than organizations that do not have so it's a key lesson for that. And during the pandemic, as we are through, because the challenge we all face is that uh, we don't know uh, 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 this pandemic, whether we are in the middle of it, at the start of it, or at the end of it. Therefore, this calls actually, uh, uh, in my view, for the board as they provide what Dr. Peter was calling the oversight role, to lower themselves a bit, of course, without impacting on the proper management, operational uh, uh, functions of the management, but to lower themselves in every aspect, be it in terms of listening, be it in terms of meetings. So one would expect that especially the risk committee maybe can be converted into some form of ad hoc crisis committee of the board that works with management and establishes clear lines of communication. Because this is a, a crisis where even management doesn't have experience, where the board doesn't have experience, we are all learners in it. Uh, so communication becomes key. A, a clear lines of communication, a formal being put in place, being laid down so that the ad hoc crisis uh, committee of the board can closely work with, uh, with the CEO uh, and the executive team. This is so crucial that uh, in the pandemic like this, you find that immediately the CEO converts into a chief uh, crisis uh, officer, if I can put it that way. So he's focusing more on the crisis, which is short term. So he's not looking at the strategic intent of the organization or the purpose of the organization as he or she should do with uh, the executive management team. So the board comes in to close that gap, especially with regards to risks uh, that affect many organizations, uh, be it SMEs or bigger organizations. You have got uh, people risk, you have got systems risk, you have got processes risk. All these have been disrupted by the pandemic. And there is so much focus, especially on people, because this affects the health of the people. So you'll find that senior management is so much focused 
on ensuring that uh, the employees are safe. So all the measures uh, uh, that are being uh, uh, taken as agents are to put the employees safe. So the board comes in with that role of making sure that there are no gaps during crisis management. We don't lose sight of where we are going. Because it's very easy for organizations as we are today to lose sight of where they are going. To actually realize after the crisis that uh, maybe they uh, 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 ended up destroying their own purpose why they were created. There is also the issue of, for in terms of system cyber a, a risk. Cyber frauds can, can happen because people now are teleworking. Uh, uh, there are so many risks that crop up that image out of that and the board needs to assist management uh, in terms of that. And also the key aspect during the uh, 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 pandemic will be the board response time. I would say maybe the availability of the board and board response time. I agree with Dr. Peter that the frequency maybe of the board evaluation process through a smaller team, maybe crisis team, uh, should be increased. To provide support, psychological support, there is nothing as good during a crisis to see that your principles, to see that your own board is just well behind you is checking on you. I got, for example, a chairman who checks on me every week and says, uh, how are things going? So you feel you are part of the system. We become a system. We become a team together with the uh, board. Then after the uh, uh, crisis, of course, uh, the board uh, also needs to ensure that uh, lessons, key strategic lessons have been learned and documented. Because I, I personally don't think that the world is going to be the same. The way we perceive health, the way we perceive the employee welfare, the way we perceive the disruption to business, the entire uh, uh, chain, supply chain, all those ways I believe they're going to change. And as an organization led by a board, they need to be de documented lessons learned from the pandemic so that these can help to reshape the organization as uh, the recovery, recovery model is being built. And also even maybe relook at the value proposition and the re redefine the risk appetite for the institutions or for the organizations. Because this will be a new normal and everything has to change and align and we have to pick the lessons we learned. So that should there be another crisis with a short term we don't uh, uh, drop. So thanks, that's what maybe I would say are the key aspects uh, of board support that will be needed uh, before, during, and after the crisis. Thanks, Angela. Okay, yes, uh, Gift, you've br brought up a, a key important point on the fact that sometimes as management, they could be focusing on survival and the board has to also help and support the, the senior management to not lose their purpose of why they exist, the bigger picture. And um, this, as I'm moving on to Antonia, uh, helps me to think on that issue of purpose because sometimes in the, in the pressure to survive and uh, pressure to get things going, we have seen issues around ethics and governance being uh, compromised during a risk, I mean, during a crisis. So Antonia, I'll just invite you to share for, uh, with us from a governance and, um, and ethical perspective. What are some of those things that are important um, in crisis management before, during, just so to ensure that even in all these responses, we don't lose our purpose and our uh, compass as to why we exist and do business and looking at issues of sustainability in the future where you compromise the long term during the short term. So Antonia, please uh, maybe share what you the perspectives you have with regards to that. Uh, uh, thank you, Angela. Yeah, like my uh, colleagues who just talked uh, explained, basically the board has the overall responsibility to oversee policies, 
practices, plans, governance. During uh, the time of peace, when there are, there's no crisis, the board should not be comfortable. They should be comfortable that everything is in place. They shouldn't take things for granted. So a board member should be asking, do we have everything that makes us comfortable in place? Now, once uh, the, the policies, practices, procedures, plans are in place, the broader plans are in place. Now, when a crisis comes in, or if a crisis comes in, then the role of the board is to actually check whether they are complying. And most importantly, I think this is, this is very important in terms of corporate governance culture, but the board must walk the talk. Corporate culture and tone at the top are the key drivers of ethical behaviors. It's very, very important. Uh, the ethical behaviors define why a company exists and what they believe in. And this should be in the mind of the board members, whether it is a crisis or not. And they should have to look at that line and put things back. Therefore, the tone at the top should be embedded in the organization of values and from the board members, the executives, and even to the entire staff, even the cleaners, that culture should prevail. That should have been done before the crisis. During the crisis, the body's role is to check whether this is happening against the agreed standards and practices. We all know that research shows that uh, integrity drives performance. And board members know that they have this responsibility to see ethical compliance. Sometimes uh, it's not easy to actually find out what is happening in organization unless you have the information. So that is the important thing that the board must always look for that correct, right data and information. And this information will help them to guide and support the board. But for all to happen, it's very, very important that the atmosphere of mutual trust, like my colleague said, accountability, respect, and the, 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 the State the, 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 the state of the tone at the top, like walking the top. The, the, the. So it is very important uh, that these things are in place. So board members should put importance in corporate culture as they put in any other issues. It's very important that uh, during the good times, they should establish clarity of behaviors and oversight controls. And for a business to be truly ethical, board members must be governed with ethics. So all those should be in place. Uh, th th there should be policies for the boards as well on how they should behave. There should be policies for, for the executives on how they should behave. And the role of the board is to check whether this is happening. In terms of compliance, the same. It's as important as ethics. You have to comply because you should always remember the uh, purpose of the organization. I mean, this is about when, when uh, you go off in terms of ethics and compliance, you have lost the whole thing. You are not into business because you are there for the purpose you are meant to be. So it's just putting in place policies and then checking whether uh, that's uh, before, then during checking, and then after, there's a lot to learn. After the crisis, what we learned from others, what we learned from our mistakes, what we learned from what we didn't do well is very important. So we, we, we learn and do better and make a better strategy. The corporate culture may not change for a long time, but we can learn and change 
the practices and actions. Uh, as for now, that's what I can say probably. Okay, thank you, Antonia. I think I'm just looking at the questions which are coming up and I see one from um, Professor Bitang and Demo. There is a crisis, then there is a crisis with uncertainty like COVID. So I believe most businesses had crisis plans for, for situations they had actually thought about. But of course, now we are in a crisis which is not certain. So based on the, this experience, are there some emergent issues that you're observing in those, uh, as you serve in the different boards that you're serving? What are those emerging um, things that we had not thought about or uncertainties and how I see he's asking how to deal under the uncertainty because um, this is a totally different uh, context. And as you are also picking up on that, there's also the issue here of um, somebody has asked uh, build, how to build uh, resilient businesses. So I think this touch a little bit, uh, I think Dr. Martin Odor, I'll, I'll direct that question. Uh, on business resilience, because I feel it touches on strategy and matters um, of how the operations will be. So as you're discussing, maybe you can touch on some answers on that question. I'll be looking through on the others. Right. <clears throat> so thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Angela. I think it is important just to uh, also learn from what we have seen a number of organizations doing uh, in this period of uh, uncertainty. I mean, previously in, in, in leadership and corporate governance, we always talked about uh, a VOCA world, um, you know, that we are now entering a, a world which, uh, you know, which would have a lot of volatility, uncertainty, um, et cetera. And what, what Professor is talking about there uh, when he talks about uncertainty. What I'm seeing is that organizations uh, have had to be very, very agile in the way that they look at their businesses. So the whole concept of agility across the different uh, things that they do, whether it's around processes, whether it's, about, it's around kind of financial management or, or management of people. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, organizations have had to very, very quickly determine new ways of working for their people. So this whole concept of remote working or working from home, uh, you know, those who have gotten it best are those who have moved very, very quickly to determine uh, how are we going to reorganize our teams? Who is going to be going in? Who is going to be staying home uh, to avoid the risk of infection? Uh, but to ensure that if we are essential services like banks, for example, that they continue to, uh, to operate how do we enable our teams from wherever they are to continue uh, working? Uh, do we get them, how do we get them infrastructure? How do we make them safe if they are coming to work, um, uh, et cetera? Do we have policies in those areas or do we write these policies very, very quickly to make sure that things don't collapse? Uh, um, Peter Kimboa talked about uh, mindset change uh, and openness and, and being ready to learn very, very quickly from internal teams and from what you see um, the external parties also, also doing. Uh, also very important that, uh, you know, nobody has got the answers, therefore being open to learn uh, from, uh, from what you're seeing uh, around us. But also just going back to, 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 to kind of uh, strategy. Um, what, what strategy do we have in place? Um, who are our customers? What is happening to them? How do we support our customers today so that they will look after, after us uh, uh, tomorrow. What's our business model today? And is that business model going to see us through the crisis? Or how quickly do we change uh, that business model uh, to be able to, to see us out of this crisis? When you talk about resilience, uh, therefore, what <clears throat> do we need to put in place? At this time, people are conserving resources, people are conserving cash. Uh, you know, people are kind of stalling some of the projects that will consume a lot of, uh, a lot of cash for today because uh, this is a long game, actually. This is not kind of a short game because you don't know when it's going to, going to end. And so how do you conserve your resources today so that you are res resilient enough uh, to continue uh, operating? And we've seen um, organizations, uh, certainly those who have not been uh, shut down completely for one reason or another, uh, organizations having teams that are looking at uh, today's business and having separate teams which are, going to which are looking at tomorrow's business. <laughs> in the new world, in the new normal, what are we going to look like? 
and therefore what do we need to put in place uh, really looking at our core business whether that core business uh, is going to be the same tomorrow or whether we're looking at uh, expansion or designing uh, different products different services uh, in response to our customer uh, and is our customer for today going to be our customer for tomorrow so is a lot of questions a lot of thinking a lot of open minded mindedness uh, a lot of curiosity i would say uh, asking the right questions about uh, you know the business today and the business tomorrow because nobody really has got the answers uh, and Okay, and I'm happy that you've said nobody really has the answers and therefore it touches on the something that uh, uh, Dr. Chimboa had said, I like to call him PK, but I don't know if I'm allowed to call him that right now. So I'll stick with Dr. Chimboa. So he had alluded that the humility from the board side to say, okay, we, are, we don't know everything. We don't know all, all we can do is ask the right question and looking at it from a coaching uh, perspective where you ask the right questions as opposed to directing. I see the questions that are following that quite touch on that aspect on the side of people. Uh, I see a question here from uh, Elizabeth Kilasa and Luis because they're all looking at how um, the boards should show uh, a keen interest in their executive, in the, yeah, on their executive, in the crisis capability of its executive team. I think it's all about supporting with the people. Then there's uh, how can companies care about their staff if they didn't have a crisis management? So it still goes back to the aspect of touching on people. So Maybe Dr. Chimboa can highlight what are other emergent issues from the pack, um, from the have come up because of this COVID in terms of people and uh, how can the board support better? Because I guess this is the one pandemic where everybody is feeling the, of course, the mental health impact. I think we have dealt with the terrorism, but usually the, the mental impact during those uh, crisis we've faced in different times has not really come out strongly. Now it's coming strongly and it's becoming something people are talking about. We must take care of the people. Um, this is a crisis that touches on the core of your people in the organization. So how does the board support that? What are those emerging things now that they need to look into? So I know you had mentioned a few, but I've seen the questions. So ideas on on that thanks very much uh thanks very much angela uh, the, yes the people uh is, is quite a, is a very important point because uh if any organization wants to succeed it must survive first yes and we, we also take note of the fact that the, the real greatest danger in the turbulence is not the turbulence itself mm -hmm. but it is responding to this turbulence with yesterday's logic. With regard to people and engaging with people and empowering them, it's a completely new thinking that we have come up with. When it comes to uh, the employee welfare and employee well-being, a number of drills and even communication channels sometimes didn't exist. But now we have to manage fear while building hope among employees. That therefore means that whether the employees that are um, that are working uh, remotely, and there are also those few who are working uh, in the in the headquarters, we have to ensure that we have regular communication, motivating these people, and also ensuring that their target and performance is moving uh, according to the target that you want. So regular communication between the supervisor and the supervisees who are working remotely is very key and motivating them. One of the issues that, again, a number of us at the board tend to kind of uh, overlook is the fact that there are deeper psychological issues when a crisis comes. Uh, this touches the way people think and feel about themselves, but also about the place they work in. The understanding now that work is not defined as a place where you go. No, work is what you do. So irrespective of where you are, you, you have to produce results. But then the crisis brings other psychological dimensions. One of the best psychology professors I know 
a lady who passed away two years ago, Elizabeth Kubra Roth. She mentioned five different stages of grief. That sometimes people go through denial. And in, in our environment, especially in East Africa, what I've seen is many of us talk about when the situation becomes normal. That's the language we are using. When we get back to work. Now, the issue is we are getting back to something totally new. We, we, are, we are thinking of a new normal, but we have to make it work. So assuming that the situation is going to go back the way it was, no, that's not going to happen. That's called denial. I'm going to go back to the same office where I was. I'm going to continue doing the same work. Nothing has changed. That's denial. And when denial is challenged, a number of people tend to lapse into kind of anger and disappointment. And beyond that anger, then people start bargaining and becoming desperate, taking desperate measures. Right now, there, there may be no need for you to feel anguish and, and fear and anxiety that they are going to lay me off and so on. Maybe the time is now to look at this situation in a totally different way in terms of reskilling and upskilling and acquiring new digital skills. If you have been working as a teller in the bank, maybe this is the time for you to uh, kind of come up with your digital marketing skills, you know, uh, website management skills, uh, infographic skills, and so. So uh, instead of going desperately into politicking, taking wrong stories to board members, and so on and so forth. So that's called bargaining. Then the next one is uh, depression, really. Depression, and depression is creating pressure within yourself beyond your capacity to cope. Now, the other stage of grief is after going through all those stages, you may then accept the reality that actually the situation has changed. This institution I work for, the bank, requires a totally different set of skills, which were not even known or defined before the crisis. So uh, again, takes us back to the issue of their deep psychosocial support issues that body members have to ensure that the management is carrying through. Because it's not just enough for people to have work, but it's also important for people to know that work is not where you go, but what you do. Then the other one is about uh, the agile way of working. The, the word agility or the word being agile really is an acronym. It stands for capacity to anticipate what could happen. That's it, agility or agile is anticipation, the capacity to anticipate. I, I was talking to a fellow body member recently and asked him that you would need to ask your CEO, how has he grown as a leader through this crisis? We are not just going through this crisis, we are going through it. How well is he reassessing the potential of this organization? And when you look at the top management team itself, what is the skill matrix we have there? Uh, do we have all the people skilled enough to take us through this crisis? And, and make sure that the new normal works. So it's a, it's a good time for us to review what we have done well, but it's a time also to reassess the potential we have in terms of people, but, and also realign our priorities with regard to people. So uh, my thinking here really is, uh, as a board, we need to examine all the assumptions behind what work means. Yes. I've read what Martin has said, I would like as a board member, and I've already asked you, some of my colleagues, what business are we really in? And some of them have told me we are in telco. Others have told me they are in banking. Others, that's a very narrow definition of what business is going forward. I mm -hmm. think we need to create some kind of bigger scope. The customer now comes in uh, very powerfully, but the scope and the mode of our business now is changing. For you as a leader now, how are you anticipating? In the word agile, this stands for generation of confidence and courage to know what you don't know, but to also to be willing to take risks, experiment, fail, and start again, and start again, and be able to. So that's the, the G, generate confidence. The I is initiate action. When a crisis takes place, uh, you don't want to sit in the middle of the road because you will be run over by a You need to see yourself in different motions of movement. Ideas must be contributed. Everybody must be keen to be working and contributing something. Then L is liberate. We liberate our thinking. Let us see what to stop, mm -hmm. what we need to start doing, and what we need to speed up as, as, as people. So liberate our thinking and liberate our thinking in terms of 
the scope of our business, but more importantly, the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, organizations and their models of business cannot sustain the post-COVID era challenges. And it is, is evaluating the results and evaluating it. And a lot of our training, because I also happen to be a trainer and so I see that maybe we emphasize so much what people need to know. And yes. we overlook the fact that we need to emphasize the deliverables, what people must deliver. So the emphasis is on outputs and outcomes. Employees, staff, and we need to remember the link between the output and what they are supposed to earn. They need to remember that. And so is management. So for us as board members, I think the, our question is very clear. How are you people building hope while you managing fear? How are you replacing uh, risk? In, and you have an engineer team and crisis management teams at different levels of the organization. What are they achieving? What are they solving? And what impact are they creating? Thanks very much, Angela. Okay, so I think uh, what is coming out really, the emerging issues of this uh, crisis and uh, boards is that, of course, now the, the structured way and sometimes bureaucratic ways that uh, boards were structured to operate have to go out of the window to allow quick decision making, to allow that agility, of course, to allow that interaction between themselves and the management and uh, a lot of um, trust and humility is required for that. But I know GIFT, you're coming from a risk compliance and operations perspective. Um, yes, you said we need to have structures, we need to, but now we are in a context where if we are too prescriptive in terms of these things, we might also limit the ability of management or the ability of uh, people to make decisions quickly. And I see also, uh, again, one of um, uh, Jaff, Mr. Jafet Kato, welcome. He's one of our course leaders leading the board there asking, to what extent should the board delegate some of the decision making? So that, um, yes, I know you'll be looking for, at that risk, but where do you find that balance? Because there's agility needed, but at the same time, of course, now there are newer risks that the organization is being exposed to. Those dynamics, how do you navigate or what has been your experience so far, GIFT? Th th thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Nens. Uh, like what was said before again, that uh, there is a very thin line uh, between the board and management. And uh, that uh, line is thinner actually during a crisis because everybody has got to be involved in it. Uh, the board, yes, need to delegate, but uh, they also don't have to abdicate their responsibilities because it's their fiduciary duty to make sure that also employees are safe, uh, the organization assets are also protected. Um, so certainly out of these, there are a lot of uh, uh, emergent issues uh, that are coming up under this uh, that affect also the risk management framework of organizations, especially those organizations that are regulated. Uh, the key issue is on digital transformation, which uh, uh, Dr. Kimboa mentioned earlier on in his earlier remarks. Uh, I think uh, post this COVID, actually, we are going to see a digital explosion as never been witnessed before. We have seen a lot of organizations, employees are working from home, use of technology has gone up, uh, electronic transactions uh, volumes have gone up in um, uh, transaction processing and uh, in financial institutions. Uh, people have now resorted to electronic means of transacting, even in retail outlets, in distribution. Almost all sectors we have seen actually increase the assimilation of technology uh, products. Uh, we have also seen the telecommuting uh, uh, increasing in many organizations. The, all these things bring a lot of risks that the board should be aware of. Uh, these risks include, for example, cyber fraud, uh, the risk of data security, 
uh, even the reputational risk or productivity risk itself. We have just been caught uh, by this crisis and immediately sent people to work from home. There have been no training, there have been no trial and error. We just said we're in a crisis, people should uh, go home and work from home. So there is actually increased also risk in terms of cyber fraud and uh, data security, uh, especially on payment systems. Uh, because working from home also there is uh, the risk of uh, knowledge by the staff, either they can be misused or abuse of that technology as well for fraudulent purposes. So all these things require the board to also have uh, oversight on such. And I think um, a, a, a going forward actually uh, the boards, especially for regulated organizations, I'm sure they will be moving towards having a balanced composition of a board in terms of age, in terms of uh, gender, in terms of experience, it, so that we have also people who are technologically agile uh, on the board, who can also move with the time on the board, who can also read these technical reports that uh, always management prepare. Because I can tell you maybe loads and loads of these reports are rarely read by the board members, especially those to do with uh, a, a, a things like cyber risk and technology, uh, technology related risks. So I, I see actually going forward more and more boards being moving towards that to make sure that uh, there is a high level of literacy in terms of the digital transformation and the digital solutions, because that's where the business is going. This crisis has made us to test that and people have seen that it works. And I don't think, uh, in fact, many organizations, I don't think uh, 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 there will be 100% office bound uh, in terms of their employees going forward. So that then calls for boards actually to take uh, quite serious responsibility on that in terms also of police framework. I also foresee actually more regulations, um, especially from health authorities in terms of uh, a, a compliance. So the cost of compliance, I think, is going to go up. More requirements in companies uh, in terms of how they uh, respond on day-to-day -day health issues. Uh, and also in terms of uh, also now the, 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 the governments and the public are being aware now of uh, the impact of viruses. Uh, I think there have been never any time when there is so much knowledge about viruses like today. So I see actually that being integrated into day-to-day -day, uh, living within the organizations. So that's how, how I look at the, image, uh, the imaging issues in terms of uh, uh, the risk management framework of organizations. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Gift. Uh, I'm seeing time is running out and I would want uh, people to ask questions. So if you have, would like to ask questions verbally, please raise your hand or click on the icon there to raise your hand. I would like to take something which is particularly very interesting or important to me. You've talked about diversity, having younger people in boards because of this new emerging aspects of uh, digital transformation and uh, you took me back to a board training we had last year and as uh, we were closing the board training I remember saying one of the board uh, directors was quite um, elderly and I was I made the comment that uh, I am happy he's been able to actually come back to class and um, and uh, you know retool and i think uh, when peter was talking about that he talked about the importance of retooling oneself now looking at uh, the boards uh, one of the comments the chair made at that time when i discussed about vuca uh, kind of dismissed and said actually um, i don't need to learn all those things because those are our children will learn now this year i would really like to meet that board chair and say I mean, it's less than an year since he made that comment and uh, both people might have to return to classes. So when we are talking about diversity, 
uh, it's obvious there are new areas, there are new skill sets, competencies that are required for board directors and um, people to be able to do a function or support management. What are, see, what are you seeing as the trend in this area? And uh, aside from what you have said, of course, incorporating younger people. So maybe I'll just take from that point. What are the new skill sets that will enable them to support boards better going forward? So I'll start with you, Mr. Um, Martin Odor, Dr. Martin Odor, sorry, just to hear your perspective. I think my, my perspective, Angela, is that, um, is that uh, age is, not, is no longer defined as that chronological age. I think one can be um, 70 years old or more and still very, very active. And we, we, we can uh, cite examples of those kind of people. Um, what, what is happening is that uh, both boards and management must uh, invest very much in learning and be learning boards continuously. And, uh, and, and I see that on, on certainly on the boards that I sit on that uh, irrespective of age, we are all uh, learning about this digital space. We are running, learning about risk. We are learning about technology. Um, obviously we expect that management would help the boards um, you know, by providing the necessary resources for, for that. But I would really like to encourage uh, board members to uh, uh, you know, up their, up their kind of uh, tentacles in terms of learning uh, and not say, you know, this is for our children because you are in those positions of responsibility uh, as a board member. And what you don't want is that uh, you don't want to be signing things off that are brought to you by management that you don't understand at all. And if you don't understand, you need to raise your hand so that uh, you get some help uh, inside or even outside of the organization. So, so, so that skill that learning skill, that open mind uh, is, is, is very, that curiosity is very, very important for board members. It has, it has been and uh, it is even much more now. And, and I can certainly, from just from my own experience on the boards that I sit on, uh, confirm that that indeed is the case and, and age is not that chronological number. Okay. That's good to hear. It's a conversation we've been having and others say, uh, even they don't want to use Zoom. So I was a bit worried because even this has to be on Zoom, it's new technology. So that's good to hear. Antonia, what would you say if, uh, as we head into the question section? I see uh, we have Afwa, then we have Mr. Jafet Kato. So Antonia, you can answer that one as we move to the question and answer, the verbal question and answer session, yeah? The question of skill set. Yes, what do you foresee? What's important yeah. going forward? Yeah, I concur with my colleagues, um, and in particular, the digital skills are very important. But I also realize that it is very important that um, board members have the entrepreneurial skills, the entrepreneurial mindset. They do it. So uh, that's the quick thinking about finding solution. It's, it's very, very important. Otherwise, um, it's, it's a kind of a tricky question, but I agree that uh, we do not know everything. We need to understand the environment. If, for example, you are um, a board member and leading the HR committee, you need to know uh, more uh, about the risk. You need to know more about other things. So we all keep learning, and it's important that uh, you know, think, as things change and as new things emerge, we have the new ideas and uh, go forward with, uh, with the rest of the world. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Antonia. So I'll just quickly move on to get any questions from the um, participants. I have uh, Hajat Se Seb... I'm trying to... Seb Biala. I hope I've pronounced it uh, right. Please, uh, I'll unmute you. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to ask, to ask a colleague who uh, proposed that uh, we should have young, younger people on the boards. But where we are now, we need to move forward as we are because we are boards uh, appointed for a particular period. I don't know if you're proposing that you know, now we disband the boards. We need to handle the pandemic as we are. 
what strategies do you give boards as they are composed now to be able to handle the strategy, I mean the pandemic? And then the other one is about the frequency of uh, board interaction or board meetings have to increase. And as you know, it comes with a cost. So what advice do you give to, you know, board? Because there's a fixed budget, how would such a cost now be um, taken into, how would it be handled? Don't you think board should now consider some pro bono sort of work? during uh, this, this period of the pandemic. So that's some of the seating sessions are not paid for. That is, that is my question, two okay. questions, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Gift, do you want to take that one? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the first one uh, is in terms of uh, the composition of the board. Uh, this was said in terms of the future. Of course, currently we have uh, said the board need to assist management in various ways, as said by my colleagues as well, uh, to say in terms of risk management, in terms of the board risk committees. Uh, but we're looking at the perspectives uh, post the COVID, that we need a mixture. Maybe if I say young people, it's a mi I say the mixture in terms of experiences, mm -hmm. in terms of gender. Why you say that is when a pandemic like this one comes, it affects all sectors, all segments of society. So you need to have representation, for, representation from all segments of the society. Not only young people, you also need uh, gender, you also need uh, various skills, IT skills on the board, accountants, you need to have a balanced mixture. So that's what I was talking about in terms of composition of the board, so that it's able to deal with any situation that comes. It has got a right skills mix. Then in terms of the frequency of the board meetings, uh, like what um, Dr. Kimboa said, it doesn't have to be very long meetings. It could be even by way of uh, a online engagements where reports are submitted to them and they review and give guidance. Because it's very, uh, in my view, during a crisis, you need leadership at all levels. Uh, during a crisis, you need leadership more than any other time. If there is any other time where the board is needed, it's during a crisis than during normal times. So I would think that ways have got to be found. I, I don't know pro bono or otherwise, but I think ways have to be found to make sure that the board is involved in the uh, 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 decisions that are made by management in terms of uh, uh, managing the crisis. And management needs that crying shoulder. It's like a parent you should be available when you are needed the most. Thank you. Thank you, Gift. I see another hand from Mr. Japheth Kato. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Japheth Kato. When uh, Dr. Martin Odur was talking about uh, 70 year olds, I thought he was talking about me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, to, to follow on what Martin said, uh, I also happened to be in a group uh, a subsidiary of a group company he probably was talking about, he is on the board training. The whole concept of reverse mentoring is something that we are doing in the whole group. And uh, it, it, it is really, as it says, where the, uh, those uh, less experienced, less knowledgeable in certain subjects, although they may be board members, learning from the more knowledgeable members of staff who may not be on Exco, but who have got the knowledge and the skills. So it is that culture. And I can tell you that I am going through that exercise and I'm finding that the young people know more about uh, a lot of things than I do. And I also know a lot more. So in fact, although it was meant to be us being mentored uh, by young people who are more skilled, it is turning out to be that we are both benefiting in this symbiotic situation. So reverse monitoring is a concept that has we, we are, we are doing and it has been very successful and it enables the board members to get capacity that they did not have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
Um, any reactions? I think before I moved on, we have Mahabub Malim with their hand up. I come from Kenya Power, and that uh, we have been faced with unprecedented, unprecedented situations uh, uh, the last two years, several times. One of which was when our top management were arrested one morning uh, without any prior warning. Um, and then recently, uh, when we had the most serious um, power outage, outage ever seen in Kenya, not long ago. So in both, in both these cases, we were torn apart between uh, our nature of uh, uh, public uh, versus private uh, corporate uh, entities that we, we both belong to. There are regulations, and you actually wonder sometimes how much of the regulations that are domiciled in the organization that are applicable at other times, for example. So the question was, and I didn't hear any of this this, uh, this afternoon, whether there is any, from the experience of the speakers, uh, whether you have, um, for example, uh, come across, um, uh, you know, um, um, not, not complying with, with certain regulations, but explaining because of, the re because of the necessity and the reality of the occurrence of events. Uh, how, how is that, how does it resonate with the, with the speakers. Okay. Uh, Dr. Martin, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, sorry, Angela. It would have been, uh, you know, been good to hear a bit more about a, a bit more details around that compliance, because clearly compliance is an important thing uh, with the regulations. It's, it's part of uh, kind of the ethical behaviors that was being spoken about earlier. Um, and so uh, he's talking about not complying but explaining um that has that brings up challenges on its own so but but it would be good to know the context uh of that so that we can then deal with it and maybe it is something angela that we can take uh, offline yes and, and, yeah, unless just... peter unless peter wants to speak about it yes peter any uh suggestions or any comments before yeah, yeah. the comments you can make it angela in general terms, mm -hmm. the crisis, yes. this crisis, this pandemic, teaches us something new that we have to really adopt. A number of places mm -hmm. where we work and the people we relate with, we need to remember that the way we work, the way we learn, the way we relate to each other is going to change. And that goes with the, our employees, our customers, our suppliers, and also our regulators and so on. What mm -hmm. is what, from my, my, where I stand as a board member in Kampala and so on, is I think we need to work towards, uh, first of all, removing friction in terms of communication and engagement. And this is why when someone asks the question that how can we have frequent board meetings and so, no, we are going to have them. And we are going to have them because now we have technology supporting very cost-effective and convenient ways of communicating. We are going to do performance management as consistently and as quickly as possible. Why? Because it's now possible to connect. It's now possible to customize. It's now possible to co consolidate at minimum cost. That's going to happen. The idea of evaluating the board at the end of the year, the idea of doing performance appraisals once, I mean, twice every year, that, that one is gone. It's not going to happen. I need to keep asking and following the conversation with you regularly to know where you stand. So number one, as a board, we need to remove the friction. Number two, in my opinion, I think we need to improve our speed and scale and the depth of conversation. Because of these things, well, according to the law, according to the existing legal and regulatory framework, most of the, the, the pandemic has taken us so far in the future. And our legal systems and our regulatory framework are so far behind. So there is that point that we need to improve on speed. The other one is to design smart interfaces. Smart interfaces between and among ourselves, as a part of our board, but also as the as we go with various stakeholders because the, the idea of saying we must have the youth on the board probably the point is not having a youth somebody who is young uh, the idea would be having a board member whether it's 50 or 60 or 70 uh, but who has got ideas that represent the generation that is so far behind the youth and, so, and this is the point about inclusion and diversity on the board so you, you don't have to have a body full of people who are age 32 or 35, not necessarily. There are many people who are 60 who think like 40 or 25 or 30. So uh, in my opinion, really, 
looking at the crisis that might have developed between the operators and their regulators and so on. Number one, remove the friction. Number two, increase the speed and scope and depth of conversation and connection. Number three, let us design smart interfaces, engagement and empowerment. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Peter. There's one last question from Paul Msava, but I'll also take the advantage and respond to the question on the regulators coming from the education perspective. What I would add to that conversation is proactively engaging them, and that is what we have done at Strathmore University. There are many regulations around exams, around uh, how we do things with the students' quality, but we have had to proactively engage the reg regulators with the new what should be and uh, propose. So I think what I could add to those who also have the regulators and maybe that, uh, so it's not about not doing the right thing, but proactively engaging so that those new areas that have changed, you're able to, to also act as and advise proactively and have that conversation. That's what I would add based on our experiences engaging the regulator as Strathmore University Business School. Um, Paul, uh, please t t uh, ask our last question as we prepare to conclude. Karibu, yeah. Paul. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you to the other uh, members of the panel. I think my question is very simple. Uh, one of the things that we've learned out of this crisis is for businesses and organizations to survive, the velocity of information flow between management and the, and the board must be quick enough so that measures can be taken for the businesses and organizations to survive. Now, there's the angle of organizations that are regulated. And I think that's what the problem is. If you need to take quick decisions so that the businesses can survive, and yet on the other side, you are regulated and the regulators may not move at the same velocity or speed because they're still doing things the old way. For instance, if there's a decision to be taken and the regulator, maybe they meet once every month and it's a physical meeting. And so you find that you can take a decision for the organization to survive to a COVID situation. Yet on the other side, you have to uh, comply with existing regulations. So I really want to hear what are the ways of dealing with such a situation, which is a reality today. Thank you. Okay. Um, Angela, if, if, yes. I may, if I may chip in here on, on, on that yes. question, I think, I think we need to give some of the regulators uh, some, uh, some kudos here actually, because uh, I have seen regulators that have been uh, very, very fast to move as well and engage and uh, accept to be, uh, to, you know, to, to, to be, col to be uh, both consulted but also to collaborate with their clients. Certainly when I look at what's happening in the, in the banking industry, uh, both here and even uh, in, uh, out, of, out of East Africa, I've seen regulators who have been able to uh, sit around the table, devise new ways of doing things, um, give leeway here and there, give suggestions here and there. And so the onus is also on organizations really, as you say, Angela, engage, uh, be proactive, um, be positive through those en engagements, give suggestions, give, uh, give ideas uh, to, to, to the regulators as well. And uh, because this pandemic affects everybody, I mean, even those regulators. And so uh, it's, 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 it's really that collaboration that uh, is important. Uh, it's speed, uh, it's that engagement uh, and the conversations, uh, thinking through and giving ideas as even as you have those, uh, uh, th those meetings. There may be a few old fashioned ones that are still not coming up to speed, but again, uh, one of the roles of the board and the roles of, uh, of management around stakeholder management is influencing. How do you influence them? What facts are you putting before them? Uh, what is the need for them and how are you helping them to help you? Uh, as well. Thanks, Angela. All right. Yes, thank you. I'll just echo your sentiments because for us, we that has worked for us. The proactivity in engaging them and coming up collaboratively with solutions has worked for us. So I would like to thank everybody. 
Uh, maybe just one quick closing remark from each of the panelists as we depart. Can we start with you, Gift? Your closing remarks as we close this webinar. Thank you, uh, Angela. Thanks very much. And thanks to Stratmore for organizing this. I think uh, during the crisis, uh, learning is a critical thing. And uh, I'm sure we are going to have more and more of this from you so that we continue these interactions. Uh, they provide uh, insight and experiences of others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gift, as well. Let's go to Antonia. Uh, please give us your closing remarks. Thank you, Angela. Uh, just uh, uh, three things. Uh, the board should be looking at um, the big questions, asking themselves, what if this does not work? So this is the situation now. We've been having plans in place, but probably for some organizations, some things did not work. So the question is, what if this does not work? Should be the big question. And then we should ask about the policies uh, we have. Uh, secondly, uh, things may never be the same again. I mean, COVID has changed a lot of things, ways of working, ways of business. So the implication I see is that uh, boards should now start thinking about how do we plan for the things that we see? How do we go about it? If things are like this, how do we embed it? in our strategic plans. I also see the importance of succession planning uh, as especially for the risk management team and for the board as well. Uh, it, it's very important that we are not taken by surprise. The other thing I see is uh, that this has uh, taught us to identify talent and the real critical roles in terms of need. So this talent should be nurtured and grown. And we should use this as an opportunity to actually go forward and empower people in the organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonia. We'll go to Dr. Chimboa. Closing remarks. My, my, my closing remarks are mainly to board members uh, to remind them to ask just about two questions only. I remember the board members must ask, analyze, and follow through. It's okay to trust management, but it's important to verify. There are questions. And the first question is, what are we missing? And the second question is, what is our next opportunity as an organization? That's all, uh, Madam Angela. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And uh, finally, we have... Uh... Dr. Martin Odor, please share your closing remarks. Um, Angela, my, my remarks uh, is probably just to reiterate some of the things that, that we've spoken about because uh, given that we are dealing with an unprecedented crisis here and we don't know, nobody knows when it's going to come to an end uh, or if it's going to come to an end at all, we are learning to live with it. Uh, the collaboration between management and board needs to be, uh, to be heightened. Um, the availability of the board is, 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 is really important. Uh, Re-examining those roles and, and, and the flexibility that, that, that is called for there. One word that we have not used very much during this conversation is the word innovation. And, and this calls for really new thinking, um, looking at, uh, even, if you, if you, even if you took the traditional balance scorecard and looked at those four quadrants, what are we innovating in each of those quadrants to help us both today, uh, go, going through the crisis, but also tomorrow as we emerge uh, from this in whatever form, it may not be the form that we expect, but in whatever form, so that we are future ready uh, for the business uh, of tomorrow because our stakeholders are still looking to us uh, to, um, for tomorrow. And so it's taking care of today, but also very much having our eyes focused on what is tomorrow going to look like for us and how do we emerge successful. So being positive, being hopeful, but also really um, collaborating in a way that will help us go through this and, and come out the better. Thanks, Angela. All right. Thank you. So I will just quick uh, give a quick highlights on some of the key things that I have uh, come through. 
And uh, I've seen that uh, I've had the issue of agility is quite important in dealing with this particular crisis, but crisis is to come. The aspect of uh, having trust because communication, all this collaboration require an, an environment of trust. So that will be key. There's also the aspect of what you have just said in terms of innovation, allowing people the space to create, fail, and learn and keep moving, I think comes out quite strongly. And the aspect of the people before, probably this has come out quite more strongly, which touches on various aspects of retooling, reskilling, and uh, to be able to move forward. And um, a key aspect of that is also the aspect of continuous learning. So those are also some of the pointers I picked up from this um, um, uh, webinar and the discussion. I'd like to thank everybody for making time to be here. Um, we have Miss Nancy Dirangu who just wanted to um, share with you the upcoming information. We have a series of these webinars on corporate governance. So she will do the vote of thanks and also just give you more information. I've seen many of you are saying this was a useful uh, forum. We want to continue the conversations and as Strathmore University Business School, we want to continuously uh, support you through the, uh, this journey as you un navigate the uncertainties. So Nancy, please Karibu, make your quick uh, vote of thanks and just uh, share when the next uh, webinar will be. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Angela. That was such a wonderful session. Thank you so much to the panelists, uh, really engaging. Um, also to the participants who have taken part in this session. Thank you so much for your attention over the last uh, 100 minutes. We really appreciate. And we are looking forward to having more sessions like this. I just want to remind everyone that this session is recorded and will be made available soon in our website. However, we'll also send an email about just sharing the same. And also we will send an email about our, our coming session, which will be next Tuesday at 11 a.m. And the topic will be on the changing role of directors during this unprecedented time. So some of the questions and topics um, that we were discussing even this day will really dive deep into next week. So we're looking forward to having all of you for that session. We will send you an email with a registration link and more details to it. Thank you all for attending. Take care, stay safe, and we look forward to meeting you again next week. Asante.